Welcome. I'm Liz Taylor, ocean explorer, naturalist, and entrepreneur. I'm Sylvia Earle. I'm an ocean elder, explorer in residence, National Geographic, and founder of Mission Blue. <laughs> this is our show, Dive In, where we host informal and open conversations with the ocean community from around the world on topics of wonder and interest. You can ask us questions in the Q&A box, and later on in the program, we will get through as many of those as we can. I am going to um, share my screen. Uh oh. <laughs> Here we go. There you are. <laughs> and uh, before we get started today, I want to remind everyone that the world is, is blue. blue. <laughs> Never forget that. <laughs> Water connects us all. Yes. Um, today we're going to be joined by our friend Ian Urbina. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist and focused really on the dark and often criminal aspects of industrial fishing, particularly on the high seas. And we urge all of you to pick up a copy of the ocean. This one. The Outlaw Ocean. Yes. There it is. <laughs> cover to cover. Read it. Ian, can you uh, join us? I know you've just uh, returned from the field. Oh, there he is. Huh. <laughs> I was waiting for my formal cue. I wasn't sure when I was supposed to enter. So good to see you. Well, thank you for joining us today. You're dry. He's, he's dry. <laughs> <laughs> but not for long, right? No. Off, like, off again. So those of you who have joined us for past episodes of Dive In, um, you know, you've heard us talk about fishing on the high seas, overfishing, and all the problems with that. But... Ian's really been focused on the human factors, um, these issues of, you know, human slavery, um, trafficking. abuse, trafficking, mm -hmm. you know, all manner of, of things that go on out there that are really out of out of sight and and mostly out of our mind uh, when we're buying uh, products that are derived from these animals. Or tuna, a big big deal. Yeah, and the ocean has a really good friend in Ian Urbina. <laughs> and so do the people who are shanghaied is the word that once was used, kidnapped, if you will, exploited one way or the other. And I'm really eager to hear your take on what's happening, Ian, and, and also what, what we might be able to do to combat it. Uh, the key is knowing. Most people are just oblivious to what's going on out on the high seas, out of sight, out of mind, and you can't care if you don't know. It's a good starting place. Mm -hmm. There you are sitting on the dock with your little backpack. <laughs> <laughs> Is this how you're, we often spot you in the field, right? <laughs> the go bag. Yep. Um, this is in Mombasa, Kenya, and that ship behind me was one that we were trying to figure out how we could sneak on. And you can see a guy in the left-hand side, he's wearing a white shirt, and he's painting over the name of the ship because they were trying to quickly change his identity. This ship was called the Greco One, part of a fleet of Grecos, and uh, they had been illegally fishing for um, quite some years in Somali and Kenyan waters. And we wanted to get, we meaning my photographer and investigator and I wanted to get on board so that we could check the serial numbers on the engine and prove that these were the illegal ships that they said they weren't. Um, so that was me there contemplating a scheme is what you, what you, what you, you mean. Do. How do, yeah. And it's, it's tough to, you know, get onto these vessels because there is so much uh, that they really don't want to have come to light. Mm -hmm. But you've been yeah. so fortunate to to be able to. I don't know whether you'd call it fortunate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With, with what you go through, is not many people would be willing to subject themselves to what what you do in order to get the straight scoop. And and really working with the guys who are out there trying to enforce what uh, rules that there are. So this is is a, a, like a, a ranger that you're working with here. Yeah, and, and I'll just, I'll go back to your original point just to sort of set a broader backdrop. Um, I mean, I think you're quite right that 
what the outlaw ocean set out to do and readers can be the judge as to whether we succeed is to sort of um indeed tackle the marine issues and the conservation issues and the environmental issues but to do so through a different entrance which is by way of the people often but really by way of the intersection between human rights labor and environmental crimes like that's where we live you know on the ocean we being myself and a couple of other folks on my team who produce these stories and and then also to sort of show the public that um um one not only is the are the problems out there out of sight and out of mind um, but they're far more diverse than people i think initially imagine they think of ocean plastic and they think of you know overfishing and they think of the bp spill and sometimes they think of somali piracy which is this this photograph um but those are that's the sort of typical extent of the spectrum uh, you guys are separate because you're specialists and experts and you know but i think the general public don't think of intentional dumping of oil sea slavery as you said arms trafficking um ship thievery and repo men who are hired to steal ships on behalf of banks um abortion providing at sea um illegal whaling um, and legal, but unethical whaling, um, uh, you know, um, and just a, a myriad of other things that happen out there that I don't think the public realize. And the, the reason I think it's important to broaden that taxonomy is that it will stoke the sense of urgency that the public and governments and consumers have when they realize it's not just one problem it's 20 and they're all under the umbrella of a lack of governance and a lack of you know public right. interest um so that's kind of our agenda um just to, to frame it more broadly you know there's there's <laughs> the phrase freedom of the seas means you can get away with just about anything right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and that that's okay if people are responsible but it's also licensed to get away with stuff yeah yeah, no, I mean, I think so. Like, um, w when I was writing the book, I wanted to get into the history, the sort of philosophical history of the sort of undercurrent that set up our present predicament. And one of the things, um, as I looked back at literature and, and philosophy and legal history that really emerged was Mare Liberum, you know, the freedom right. of the seas. And as a legal concept, it sort of had you know, this guy Grotius, you know, had this notion that the seas, be, especially the high seas, international waters should be protected as belonging to no one and, and ostensibly everyone. And what that means in practice is that commerce, you know, should be allowed to move across it in a way that is unfettered by any individual actor, be it pirates or be it one particular government. And that, again, in a, in a, in a law setting and an economic history setting makes a lot of sense. Um, but the, de the dark underside of, of that is, well, on the one hand, we've, we've got a, a global commerce now that delivers an iPhone or Nike shoes or $1.99 can of skipjack tuna, like, within a week of it being not even existing, right? The tune is existing, but before it's pulled out of the water or, you know, things come to the shelf, whatever the product is in impossible, you know, efficiency and at impossibly low prices, partially right. because they travel by ship, you know, not on plane, not on rail, not on truck, but they're traveling through this unfettered Mar Liberum international waters where there aren't, you know, as many rules, police, you know, and and taxes and um, uh, customs officers that are sort of slowing it down. But that, that's and the upshot of that is we get cheap stuff fast, right? Too much, too fast. But. In there, there's a lot of talk about the subsidies that mm -hmm. governments provide to the fishing industry and others, but specifically the real problems here with the fishing. But there's a human subsidy. Yeah. It's a cost in human lives yeah. and the, the labor that is bought if they if they get paid at all can you at a low low level can you tell us a little bit about the story here of a uh, lang long yeah so so lang long and this is a perfect segue to sylvia what you're saying like there is this hidden cost in um a lot of the distant water fishing fleet and the hidden cost is 
um, or a hidden subsidy is uh, the impossibly low wages and, and brutal you know, working conditions, not to mention the violence and other abuses, murder sometimes um, with impunity. And all of that together is essentially an industry subsidy by way of inaction on the part of governments. And it's a subsidy in the sense that you know, a, a, a fishing fleet, let's say in the case of Lang Long ship, this guy you see, he's Cambodian, but he was working on a Thai ship. And the reason the Thai fleet can be so um, bloated and too many boats on the water, under mechanized boats, economically unviable boats, is that the ship captains and fleet owners are able to stay in operation because they can depend on slave labor, right? So slave labor, in, right. In the form of, of, of in Thailand, as is this case here, it's mostly Loatian, Cambodian, and Burmese, uh, Rohingya um, workers that are fleeing desperately poor, often extremely violent uh, countries to come into Thailand, which is a middle class, fairly stable country. They take these jobs, incredibly cheap, um, wages. They go off to sea. Sometimes they don't even know that they're taking a job in fishing when they enter the country illegally. Most of these are undocumented migrants. Um, and they enter the ship and they go off to sea and they're kept there. So in Lang Long's case, um, he was sort of a textbook instance of a trafficked migrant came in from, my, from Cambodia, thought he was going to get a job in construction, ended up at the ports, walked onto, you know, you know, sort of sent onto a ship. They go off to sea. Um, he's sick all the time, beatings, in awful situation, attempts to flee. He jumps overboard and tries to swim to a supply vessel, is caught, brought back. And from then forward, they shackle him. The captain uh, shackles him by the neck whenever he's not working. And over the course of the next two and a half years, um, Lang Long is sold ship to ship, but usually shackled, right? And a supply vessel worker sees him shackled, um, delivers the goods, goes back to shore, the supply vessel gets in touch with an anti-trafficking folks and says, you know, I saw, you know, I know things are rough out there, but I saw something that was really shocking. And that began a whole process of buying Lang Long's freedom. And I had heard about the case and interviewed Lang Long about 10 days after this picture was taken about 10 days after he had been rescued, um, bought into freedom uh, in Songkla, Thailand. Um, and we chronicled his story in the, in the New York Times. It's an he's, amazing story. He's just one. Yeah. But he's an example, and yeah. So this is the luxurious uh, captain's cabin, right? <laughs> On one of the vessels. <laughs> what did your quarters look like, Ian? <laughs> uh, I slept where the crew slept, so I slept um, in, in these sorts of settings. I usually preferred to, to sleep outside because, um, <laughs> you know, on, on the deck, but you had to make a call. Either you were in these tight quarters where the air was impossibly hot and or you're out on the deck where it was cold and there are a lot of rats. So you kind of had to choose your medicine, but I usually chose the outside. But yeah, this, these are these are um, living quarters for crew. That's a Cambodian um, worker there. They make these hammocks out of um, fishing nets. And the, the reason, look, he's only like about two feet off the ground. You can't stand up in these quarters. No. But the reason they stay up off the ground is because when the rats take over the ship, which is usually when working stops, so the really late hours, um, the one place they don't tend to crawl over are the, are the um, hammocks. So I learned that the hard way by sleeping on the floor. <laughs> Yikes. So that little nut backpack that you carry around, does it have a hammock in it? <laughs> It did after that first experience when I when I learned my lesson. Yeah, it, it is a hammock and it's got, you know, all sorts of other oddball things, peanut butter and, you know, just like kind of crucial things I need to um, um, survive Yeah, to manage. Yeah. And then you had this opportunity to go out with the um, Sea Shepherds. And we usually think about Sea Shepherds and their work on, um, you know, both legal and illegal whaling, just trying to call attention and um, I think uh, this this image you sh shared was taken with a drone, wasn't it? And yeah. uh, they, the minute that they realized they were being kind of uh, watched, they covered up the evidence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, right. yeah. But, yeah. I mean, this this was um, the the end of the whaling effort when um, that Sea Shepherd had been engaged in, as you well know, um, for many years, and this was kind of 
the frustrating tail end of their efforts where at this point on this particular mission, and, and this was in 2019, um, the Nishinmaru and, and, the, and, the, and the Japanese fleet um, uh, had seemed to always be a couple steps ahead of Sea Shepherd and more able to evade them. Um, and, uh, and so any, anyway, um, uh, that is when Sea Shepherd said, um, they've sort of out the, the sort of the Japanese fishing fleet, the whaling fleet has outpaced us in terms of the kind of intel they've got and, and their ability to, to, to evade us. And it just doesn't seem viable anymore for us to f furthermore, Japan changed its laws mm -hmm. and essentially made this sort of work by Sea Shepherd and the like, essentially a terrorist level um, crime. And the stakes became really, really high for even for non-Japanese Sea Shepherd folks to be engaged in this kind of direct action project right. conservation work. So a lot happened, and, but this was one of the final missions. But this this related mission um, it was just such an epic tale. Uh, really, I mean, just mm -hmm. it's just such an incredible story. Where, you know, we see the, the these kind of rogue fishing vessels. They often will turn off their satellite transmitters, so that even people who are trying to enforce things, trying to understand like what the catches are and where they're coming from, they're they kind of go dark, right? And and um, nobody really was enforcing it and so the sea shepherd turned around and they're like you know we're not having this <laughs> and and they set off um chasing the thunder and it went on for like months weeks yeah 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 i mean so so operation ice fish as it was called was this mission um to sort of um show the world uh and shame governments um, on a couple of issues. One was, as you said, the problem of ships going dark, turning off their transponders and becoming invisible and therefore able to get away with anything. But the other was, and in some ways the more serious one was, even when the ships keep their transponders on, there was this thing called the Interpol Purple List. And to get, a, a, for a ship to be placed on the Purple List meant you had to be in, have engaged in really bad action for a long, well-documented period of time. And there were seven ships on the Purple List at, at, the, at the time of this event. Um, and these are, the, the Purple List is essentially an arrest on site list. It's, you know, the, you know, kind of most wanted on an international level, these ships are bad news. But the, the reality was, and what, what really annoyed Sea Shepherd and, and a bunch of other folks, including folks at the Inter Interpol, was that no one was arresting these vessels and they were coming in and going out of port and unloading their ill-gotten catch and making millions of dollars. And the Sea Shepherd and the Thunder, which is the ship on screen, was at the top of that list. It had earned $67 million of, of money uh, over the course of a decade um, fishing illegally in the Southern Ocean, primarily targeting two fish. And um, so Sea Shepherd said, you know what, we're going to go out, we're going to find the the purple listers, you know, the, the ships on here. Um, we're going to prove that it's not that hard to do. And then we're going to chase them and we're going to harass them. And we're going to, we're not going to ram them, but we're going to throw all sorts of spotlight on them every time they try to go into port to embarrass everyone involved uh, allowing this to happen and so the thunder they found and they chased them for 110 days through you know hell and gone and um, ultimately the, the, the thunder sunk itself um, to get rid of the evidence and and the crew and the officers were rescued and prosecuted but yeah as you say it was it was an epic story. There you see the Sam Simon and the Bob Barker on either side, these two Sea Shepherd ships chasing the thunder on this 110 day epic event. Just pretty, pretty amazing. I mean, through the, from the ice fields uh, all the way along and ultimately they decided yeah, tell, to- Tell the story, what happened? Yeah, no, I mean, as, as Liz, you were saying, like the, 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 the chase began with the impossible, um, uh, start where you know a lot of people didn't think that sea shepherd would be able to find the thunder in, in the southern ocean they had really no pre-existing intel but they kind of cobbled together where they thought they would be fishing and they got a little help from different agencies and they found the thunder nets in the water and they announced that they were trying they're going to make a citizen's arrest and the thunder decided to run and off they began and over the course of the next 110 days you know, the thunder went through a category five storm. This specific area of, of um, 
longitude that you know normally you you wait for storms to pass and then you slip between them the thunder decided to go straight through it hoping you know i can only we can only speculate hoping that they would lose their pursuers by doing such a crazy thing and of course that didn't work and then they went through this incredible ice field which is super dangerous the icebergs can sink ships and often do um that didn't shake them at some point the thunder got so frustrated that it turned around and began charging at the Sam Simon Bob Barker um, to ram them um, because the the Sea Shepherd guys took uh, some of the nets that were in the water from the thunder and confiscated them. So for, for a while, the thunder was stationing the Sea Shepherd guys. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it just went on and on and on. And I was on for a very short while. I was lucky enough to sort of um, finagle my way out to sea and get on board and chronicle it directly on board. Um, but it went all the way up to, you know, the coast of near Nigeria. And um, it was really unclear what was going to happen. All parties were running out of fuel, out of food. Um, and then suddenly a, a sort of SOS call came in from the captain of the Thunder saying they needed help and they were sinking. And so they all abandoned ship and the Sea Shepherd guys with cameras mounted on their helmets quickly climbed on as the ship was sinking. It took, you know, an hour and a half for the whole thing to sink, but they ran around the ship and collected evidence, grabbed papers and footage before it went down and then rescued all the, the crew and, and thus began a whole law enforcement legal process where the officers were prosecuted. So it was this amazing tale, which rarely happens. I mean, this is the sinking of evidence and ships going down where bad things happen. That's pretty commonplace. It's a right, but the actual, you know, engagement of law enforcement and the capturing of the guys and all that was really unusual and in many ways a, a real um, success uh, for exactly what Sea Shepherd set out to do because the story became world. And there's a, a film was made documenting this about the chase, and the last thing that the thunder really wanted was to go to port right, with right. the evidence. Right, that's right. Which yeah. is why they chose the drastic means of pulling the chain. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look at this crew. Look at these. What's in, in, impressive among other things, <laughs> how many women there are. Yeah. Well, the captain, the captain yeah. of the vessel is a woman. Yeah. She's kneeling there on one, she, this is her uh, kneeling on, on one in the knee center. in the with center. The yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's quite right. So, I mean, having spent six years getting on a lot of these vessels, it is just shocking how male a world, um, the fishing, the long haul fishing um, arena is. Merchant Marine, you you know, it's, it's still extremely, I'd say 5%, you know, female, 95% male. Um, but green, the two places where I encountered truly 50, 50, 60, 40 kind of statistics were Greenpeace ships and Sea Shepherd ships. Um, uh, just, you know, and also just incredibly diverse, in, you know, um, nationally, you know, you had, you know, 10 different uh, countries on board. And uh, so it was really impressive. You know, it's, it's amazing, really, that, that there is this, you know, that they're not there for the money. They're there because they really believe they can make a difference. Yeah. And it's obvious that they are making a difference. And it's it's not a male female thing. It's, <laughs> it's clearly like getting the job done. <laughs> yeah, and and <laughs> women are welcome. Yeah, yeah. To yeah. Be part of the action. Yeah. And I guess that stems from the attitude of Paul Watson and the leaders of both Greenpeace and Sea Shepherd. It's in the culture. Yeah. It's, it's, it's right, about right. yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's really bring bring, yeah. bring what you've got, and we it's gender neutral. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. excellent. But one one thing I wanted to ask you about, and I know you've been kind of dealing with some of these um, issues, is um, not, I just this boat's just kind of an example of you know another one of these fishing boats. But you know, in this time of COVID, we've been seeing quite a number of vessels that are just kind of out there doing their thing one day, and the next day they're just turned off. Mm -hmm. You know, the parent company just shuts them down. They stop sending money. And again, we're having the situation where the uh, primarily men and boys on board are just kind of left stranded mm -hmm. uh, wherever they happen to be in the world and really have no good way to, to get home. 
Um, could you tell us a little bit about some some of those things that are going on? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a really I'm I'm thrilled you brought it up because um, you know this line of reporting has a lot of very dramatic things in there, murder and slavery and things that you know more easily grab the attention of editors and readers, you know, because they're so um, uh, urgent and acute. Um, but the, the, the subtler and slow motion, um, uh, but in some ways equally life-threatening problems are the ones that are, as a journalist, hard to get people to care about. And seafarer abandonment is a textbook example of one of those things that a, it's a it's a abuse that happen, happens passively and in slow motion, but it results in people's lives being ruined and people dying and stuff like that. But it's very hard to get people worked up about it. And it's as you say, it's a long running major problem. It's on merchant vessels as well as fishing vessels, and it's exactly as you described, Liz, like um, a ship uh, owner, a ship insurer, um, a fleet owner, whoever is the key player back on land. Um, makes a sort of calculated decision, maybe because they got sued by someone and they realize, oh, we got to cut our losses. Maybe, you know, because they, one of their ships runs into some huge fine someplace and they can't afford to pay it. Who knows? But essentially they, they decide to um, sever the tie with the vessel. And the vessel is anchored a mile off of you know, England or Ghana or Venice or, you know, Argentina, wherever it is. Yeah. Um, and those folks, the captain and everyone on down doesn't do anything without clearance from land, right? So they're constantly in communication. Where are we heading next? What should we do next? Et cetera, et cetera. What route? All these things. And all of a sudden the phone stops working, the emails stop coming and they the people on board don't have the, the immigration papers to get off, you know, and travel by land, the finances to do it. Um, they don't have the fuel or the finances to, to sail all the way back home. Um, and so, and they're also just unsure whether they even have the clearance, you know, is this just the guy had a heart attack and he's in the hospital for a week? Or is this because he's just like cut us loose and we're on our own? And so a week turns into a month, turns into six months, turns into two years. And these guys are sitting there, no clean water, no food, kind of their families often don't have any idea, especially the crew who have, you know, um, language barriers and, you know, uh, no internet access and all these things. And so um, things get really, really desperate from a mental health point of view for the crew. They try to jump off the ship and swim to shore. They drown. They try to sneak into the country. They get locked in a detention facility as, as undocumented immigrants. Again, it's just this spiraling situation. If they ever even make it home, um, all of their licenses are expired. They have no wages for the all the missing period. You know, they're in really dire situations. And um, even making it home doesn't mean they're on the road back because now they're in debt and they don't have the ability to get a next job. So, um, and this is happening every, at any given moment, there are hundreds of ships around the world that are in exactly this predicament. And there's very little infrastructure for helping these people. It's another example of, the importance of what you're doing, Ian. People can't care if they don't know. Mm -hmm. And even if you, once they care, it's getting motivation to do something about it. Mm -hmm. But at first you have to know. Right. And yeah. I'm confident that this is news to most people. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it's just happened more and more, particularly during the pandemic. That's right. right. We're really yeah. seeing a big uptick in it. and. And, you know, in the, a lot of the, with the fishing boats, I mean, a lot of the animals that are, the wildlife that's being taken is not sort of your dinner plate fish. You know, it's not, it's not all tuna. It's not all. Oh, the tuna is a big problem. The tuna is a big problem. Yeah. But a lot of it is like the, you know, even the, the small bait fish or the so-called trash fish. <laughs> Don't hit me. <laughs> um, you know, that, that. Um, fish. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're just being kind of ground up into products that we don't even really think about being associated with Chicken fish. food, cat food, cat dog food, food, cosmetics, cow food. <laughs> you know, yeah. fish oil, you know, this kind of sketchy. Aquaculture you know. feeds the salmon. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And, right. and so um, have, you, have you seen that as you've been out in the field where, you know, you've kind of, I mean, most people think of fishing that it's, you know, that it's going to be like a Chilean uh, yeah. Like yeah. fish or something. It's an incredibly timely question because, um, 
uh, there's a piece coming out in the New Yorker February 15th um, that's you know a year and a half in the making. Um, it, we reported it off the coast of Gambia. Uh, we were on a Sea Shepherd vessel that was there doing a patrol in coordination with the Gambian government, uh, which didn't have vessels of its own. And the focus of the story was the presence of foreign vessels, largely Taiwanese and Chinese in Gambian waters, some of them licensed and some of them not, but all of them targeting this fish called bonga fish, B-O-N-G-A. And bonga fish for, for eons have been um, very plentiful, very nutritious, and key to subsistence for Gambians and Senegalese. And sort of, uh, um, they were so plentiful that um, a decade ago, you would go to the little fish market and they would give bonga away for free, you know, to the locals and try to sell the other stuff. Um, well, bonga is now targeted for um, 17 uh, fish meal factories that oh, are wow. in Senegal, Mauritania, and Gambia. And the local fishermen um, uh, can't keep up with the industrial boats that are netting all the bonga for the fish meal. And the fish meal factory, as you know, but maybe your viewers don't, you know, they grind the fish up into these high protein pellets that they then mostly use in this case to feed aquaculture. So the salmon and the shrimp and the things that are being grown in either near shore or on land fish farms that for many years were thought to be more environmentally sound because they were ostensibly slowing ocean depletion of wild caught fish are actually accelerating the depletion of wild caught fish because enter Gambia, uh, the boats are now catching all the wild caught fish to feed them to the farmed fish, to feed them to the Norwegians and Americans and Brits and who are eating farmed fish thinking they're doing a good thing. So it's this crazy cycle and, and that's what the story is about. And, and the equation is that it takes, you know, large numbers of the right. small fish to get small numbers of the big fish. It's not a good business right. model. Yeah, no, it's, it's nobody pays fish. for the fish. Fish are free. Yeah. At least that's how they're accounted for. And Ian, I really appreciate the way that you put your, put the light on the connection between, of course, the excruciating issues with respect to humans, but it, it's, it's ocean chemistry. It connects back to climate. We're disrupting the, the carbon cycle by taking so much of the wildlife out of the ocean. Mm -hmm. So there are many layers of wrongness here. And, and yeah. many, many things can be solved if you look at where does the fish come from? Who's being affected? What, what does this do to the, the, the ocean chemistry? Mm -hmm. What's it do to, I mean, so many things are connected to abusing the, the way we treat the ocean and wildlife yeah. in the ocean, as well as the human life associated yeah. with fishing. Yeah. No, I mean, you're right. So, I mean, the, the, um, if you even just look at the carbon footprint, so most take squid, right? Um, oh, yeah. That's another California, it's, it's small fish and squid. Right. You guys are in California, so you know this well. Like, California squid gets sent to China to be processed, to get sent back to California restaurants. And the That's carbon great. footprint of that is insane, right? Yeah. Same thing with bonga fish, taking the fish out of Gambian waters to then put it in a Chinese owned factory that makes it pelletizes it, then it ships the pellets to China that then gets sold to Norway, that then gets fed to the salmon in Norway that get, that gets shipped to, I mean, the carbon Chicago. footprint that makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah, um, right. uh, it's, it, it's, but I mean, it's, it's your great work that's really helping people to understand um, where these connections are how it makes absolutely no economic sense that, that a lot of it is really uh, covered by these subsidies um, and and the human subsidy and the factor. human subsidy factor mm -hmm. uh, and then we're also seeing it showing up in just the you know the the plummeting of biodiversity at large mm -hmm. because it's, you know you take out those small fish and that's the food that you know a whole host of other animals are reliant upon from and the squid and the squid you know from from whales to seabirds to sharks you know just a report today saying that like 70% of the oceanic sharks are have been depleted in the last, just in the and last rays. 50 sharks years. And rays, sharks and rays. Yeah. And then there are the tuna down by 90%, the blue fins mm -hmm. in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. Well, more than 90% in the Pacific, mm -hmm. only 90% in the Atlantic. <laughs> the good news is there's still some tuna left 
The good news is there still are some of these little fish off Africa, mm -hmm. Menhaden in the Atlantic, similar same, story. Same story, yeah. Um, around the world, we have looked at fish as if they're free, mm -hmm. literally a counting base of zero until you take them out of the ocean. Yeah. So a whole host of economic false accounting. Mm -hmm. We don't account for the human factor. We don't account for the subsidies. We don't account for the cost of the fish yeah. because they are free, right? Yeah. <laughs> Until they're dead. Yeah. And then you pay less than they're really worth even then. Yeah. So what can, what, what can consumers do to, to make, you know, kind of better choices? And, and, and I just want to like, you know, um, false accounting is a really great turn of phrase, Sylvia, that fits very much within, I wish I had heard that before I'd written the book, because on the on the notion of hidden costs, which is a term you hear often, so it's almost- Write like, another book. I was going to say that, yeah. <laughs> Next book, come on. <laughs> Easier said than done. But, um, but I mean, I think um, much like we long viewed the sky, right, the atmosphere, another global common, as a bottomless trash can where we could release carbon um, endlessly, and it really didn't matter because the dilution of the expanse would cause it to flush away. Like, this was the the intellectual history of of that wrong false accounting. Similarly, the water, the marine realm, was viewed as a sui generis, self replenishing, bountiful realm where you kind of um, could take stuff out, but they they re replace themselves, you know, and and that also was the core misconception of a long false accounting, you know, that um, now science is saying, oh, wait, you know, they're all, they're all at the edge of collapse, you know, um, but, but we for knew. so many decades that was not thought to be possible. Yeah, the knowledge was there, but it wasn't generally accepted. Right. We, we need to get to that level of now we know, not just a handful of scientists or other Right. people who care to follow the evidence right, right, right. <laughs> like you right 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 well what can, i mean you you asked what can be done i mean i think um like i think i always like to take a step back and if we're talking about the full range of problems that we're attempting to report on so from murder of stowaways to arms trafficking, to the turning off of transponders, to subsidies that cause there to be too many boats on the water, to sea slavery, to intentional dumping of oil. You know, these are very diverse problems, but they all are happening on the water and they have effect on the people and the place. Um, I think the, the solutions that cross all of them are um, the best ones that should be started first, marine protected areas, required transponders, better supply chain data, et cetera. Um, I think if people think of themselves, the thing, the thing they should do is, first of all, don't try to figure out how can I tackle all these problems, just choose which among them speak to you most and uh, focus on those. Um, mm -hmm. So if it's if and think of, are you at, you know, all of us are taxpayers, consumers, voters, you know, where we have partners and kids and, you know, we have people that we're around and sort of talking to all the time. So we're kind of educators in that sense. Like, so we all are wearing lots of different hats and in, and we're donors, you know, we, we give money to things that we believe in. Um, and I think like, if you think of yourself in all of those ways, then you can find lots of little things you can do. Oh, I can, if I'm going to eat, I can stop eating seafood. Or if I'm going to eat seafood, I can try to do so in a more responsible way. And to inform myself, I'm going to go start just a half an hour spent looking through one of these resources like Monterey Bay Aquarium, you know, or, you know, that well, attempt. Good place to start in is to think of it as sea life, wildlife. Yeah. Instead of food, looking right. at everything in the ocean as if it's there to be consumed right. one way or the other as a product or as food. Right. Say, look, the, the greatest wildlife trade on the planet is ocean life. Mm -hmm. We call it seafood. It's right. ocean right. life. Right. And, yeah. and every, every shrimp counts. <laughs> it does. But it's right. true. I mean, if you think about it as if, you know, what kind of land wildlife do most people eat? You know, maybe they get a, you know, they're 
they get a deer or, you know, maybe elk, something, you know, or something like this, but it's not something you go to the store and Songbirds. get every day, you know, and, and you certainly don't press a bunch of robins to get, you know, bird oil, you know, it's just, it's just doesn't happen, you know, <laughs> at least it shouldn't happen, but, but, uh, <laughs> but it's kind of wacky. And, and I, and I, I appreciated too, that, you know, this connection that you're bringing back to the, you know, to the use, just the really the overuse and the subsidy of, you know, just of um, petroleum is that, products. Is that, is that you there with a the black hat on? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good guys are supposed to wear white hats. But <laughs> not when it's that cold, you know. <laughs> Maybe but, it's blue. Right, exactly. Any hat that's given to me, it's going on. <laughs> that's right. But but you've been working uh, a little bit more now with under the kind of the UN umbrella, not just New York Times, right? So it gives you a little bit more protection and you know, getting out of uh, dicey situations when when you right. need to. Yeah. But, yeah. But yeah, this yeah. was this is that project where I guess Greenpeace is just trying to bring more attention to um, right. the you know the the real dangers of some of the offshore oil and gas exploration. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So so the carbon cycle again. The carbon cycle again. Yeah. This this was a really great story. So what you're looking at here is is a drilling rig called the Songa Enabler. It's a Norwegian drilling rig, and it was distinct in a couple of ways. One, it was a drilling rig that was going to be dropping um, uh, into the seafloor further north into the Arctic than any drilling company had ever attempted to go. So more extreme conditions and legally dodgier because they were, by some legal perspective in international waters where they weren't allowed to be doing this. The Norwegians said because of, you know, complicated, you know, geographic um, arguments about where the plate was, that it was actually still Norwegian waters. But be that as it may, this was way further into the Arctic than anyone thought was, well, not anyone, a lot of skeptics thought was prudent because if there was a spill up there, it was going to be really, you know, BP was tough to clean up, imagine up here in these conditions. And it was also just encroaching further and further into this very pristine, delicate habitat that thus far didn't have this amount of industrial activity. So Greenpeace was trying to get to their parking spot, um, this drilling rig floats, you know, it travels, you guys know this, but, right. um, and so Greenpeace was trying to get there to the exact coordinates before the Songa neighbor would get there and, and essentially set up a barracks, you know, like um, set, set up, um, uh, you know, uh, put the ship right in the key parking space and occupy the space and make um, a sort of um, public spectacle of um, this problem and um, force the Norwegian Coast Guard uh, to arrest them and remove them and just slow down the whole process, which cost millions of dollars to the oil and, company, oil and gas company. Unfortunately, it didn't work out as they wanted. Um, Greenpeace didn't get there fast enough. The Songa enabler got there first, um, but Greenpeace entered the zone anyway, illegally, you know, this surrounding zone, uh, you know, staged these protests and uh, were summarily arrested by Norwegian Coast Guard and the ship was towed back to Norway and, 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 um, and you know, impounded. Uh, but it did end up, you know, slowing down the Songa enabler and, um, you know, creating a lot of public awareness about what the Norwegians were doing. And what's, what's also key is this is Norway, right? We often think of Scandinavia as, which it is, you know, a very progressive place and the governments have really good policies in many regards, but the Norwegians are very aggressive on their oil and gas drilling. And this was an, another point that Greenpeace wanted to make was that um, uh, um, Norway was not living up to its reputation as an environmental mm -hmm. steward by expanding aggressively on oil and gas drilling into a space that most folks thought was perilous. Right. And it's not just, you know, the risk of the, you know, the oil spilling or blowout or, or as you say, the, the, how difficult and dangerous cleanup would be in, in basically Arctic conditions compared to, you know, quasi tropical Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. But it's also just the, you know, the introduction of an incredible amount of noise into the mm -hmm. environment. And mm -hmm. the fact that we should be leaving the oil and the gas in the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the ground's covered by water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's also just, um, it, it's stoking an addiction that has created climate change. And so anything that frees up more of that drug, you know, kind of is bad, you know, so um, uh, exploration in and of itself is uh, oil and gas exploration is simply 
expanding the problem, which is a dependence on fossil fuels rather than redirecting attention and economics towards alternatives. So that was the other big point that they wanted to make, as you guys are saying. Yeah. And it's great that you're, you know, kind of doing more of the, I think, under the broader umbrella of the UN and, and getting a little bit more, I mean, you still do things in the New York Times and stuff, but a little broadened out and, and people are now able to, uh, you know, help support you directly, which is really awesome. So. How do they do that, Ian? What's the mechanism? Yeah, I, I love it, that, and I think people should. I want to end on a, the pictures on a upbeat note instead good. of. Yeah. <laughs> I I agree. Yeah, that's right. Let's enter the <laughs> little harmony. Little harmony here. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. No, I mean, so so um, after 17 years of the Times, I I wanted to to stay on this line of reporting. And so I created a journalism nonprofit called the Outlaw Ocean Project. And our, it's, um, like I say, it's nonprofit. We produce these kinds of stories. And our goal is that we put them in tier one venues. So we still publish in the New York Times, but also um, we go global. So Der Spiegel and BBC and the Australian Age and, you know, um, and, uh, and then we translate them into six different languages and we, we provide these stories for free to these tier one outlets. Um, and then we do all sorts of other creative things, uh, work with musicians to try to make music based on the stories, et cetera. Um, but it's all funded by large philanthropies and do individual donors. And if you just go to the website, theoutlawocean.com, there's a place where people can donate to continue supporting these kinds of stories. But we, we don't, you know, I work with the UN as an investigator, but I still am a journalist. And so I try to make sure I'm not becoming an advocate, you know, or else I'll lose my ability to, you know, publish in the New Yorker and the New York Times if I become an advocate. So I'm right at that edge. Um, uh, but now I can do it in, with a much broader but, set of partners. But you're just not taking sides. You're showing facts. Yeah, it's the evidence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The evidence yeah. is so overwhelming. It's. Uh, it might seem as though you're taking sides, but you're not. I mean, it's just here. Here's what's going on. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I just. I just. The, there are small things that are quirky and distinct to the profession. But if ever asked, like, well, should I buy this tuna or that tuna or no tuna at all? Like very concrete, like, what should I do? Questions. I never engage. So I say, okay, here are the resources and yeah. people you can go to and you should ask them. I've vetted them, I've talked to them, I trust them, but I can't ever advocate a specific solution. I can give you the evidence. And I also try to really keep my lines of communication open with the oil companies and sure. the and all these folks so that I can do a good job in explaining their perspective. Even if I disagree with it, I just try to kind of clinically lay it out there. But so that's, that's the only difference, um, uh, you know, but I don't know many who put themselves on the line the way you do and put a hammock in your backpack <laughs> <laughs> for when it's needed. <laughs> yeah, well, I when amenities it. are short, you, right. you're, you're prepared. He doesn't have just a mosquito net. He's got the rat net. You know? <laughs> a wraparound mosquito net. Cocoon, we call it. Um, Cocoon, yes, yes. Well, anyway, it was really great talking to you guys. Um, and, and thank you so much for... You know, we, we have some well, questions. We've, we've got some questions as well. <laughs> yeah. So you might being... we're going to, so yeah, so we're going to take questions and you can also raise your hand using the little raise your hand feature. And if we get anybody doing that, then uh, Gigi will call on you and she'll let us know that someone's there. Um, so Liam is asking, given the human propensity towards slavery over our long history, how do we move mindshare from the passive not supporting slavery to the act of anti-slavery, slavery, similar to today's idea of being anti-racist? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I, I guess maybe I would take a, a little bit more optimistic uh, outlook, which is uncomfortable for me because I'm always the dark pessimistic guy in the room. But, um, uh, but I, I don't think that um, most of the world um, is comfortable with slavery. I think that most of the world um, uh, either doesn't know about it or um, doesn't see it defined in the, the way that we are here. Um, so, you know, in some places in the world, the notion of having a 13 year old who's working in your factory to pay off a debt because, um, 
someone transported that person from another country to that factory and that cost. And so they got to pay off that debt. So that means they're going to work for free for six months. That's called debt bondage. Well, that's also called slavery, right? You know, and, and most of the Western world legally and just um, has kind of wrapped their head around that that's not um, a safe or fair labor contract. Um, uh, and again, shackling people on these things. So I don't think the problem is that I think it's more the case that buyers, you know, are too far removed from the things that they're buying, mm -hmm, whether it's yeah. stuff coming from the sea or stuff coming from China. And um, our economy, our globalized economy has leveraged that decentralized nature of commerce and making of stuff to such a degree and sometimes intentionally so as to remove the consumer from the producer. So there isn't really an awareness with most of the consumers about the conditions. Um, and, you know, folks like you in the research you're doing and journalists and lots of folks, lawyers and policymakers are constantly trying to resist that. But I think that's more of the supply chain getting longer and more complicated is a bigger reason in my view that um, slavery has um, remained um, a presence. Yeah, well, one example, the salmon farmers will say that they're just feeding salmon chow and <laughs> it only takes four, four or five <laughs> pounds of salmon chow to make a pound of, of the fish that goes to market. But where do, the, where do those little pellets come from? Right. Right. What's involved in making them? Right. The little fish have a cost associated with them. In fact, they eat too. So if you start with plants, you say how much yeah. does it take to make a how many start with sunlight and photosynthesis and plants how many pounds of plants to make a pound of cow mm -hmm. it's about 20 pounds mm. plus or minus mm. but if you're talking about a farmed salmon it's not how many pounds of pellets it's how many sun rays go, go into making the plants how many pounds of plants to make the plankton that makes and how many pounds of plankton to make the little fish that make the bigger fish that ultimately make the pellets that go into make it? I mean, you, yeah. the supply chain. Yeah, <laughs> it is yeah. a it's supply, a supply chain. web. Yeah. But then you <laughs> add on top of that the human cost. Yeah, that, yeah. That you have made more awareness, more apparent. Yeah. Really. And and it's really important to know where does my food come from. It's kind of just demanding that transparency, mm. you know, because we we're just bombarded by these these marketing campaigns all the time, you know, whether it's the and, shiny and, lipstick or whatever it is, but it's got some and, ocean product in it. And and how do I make a difference? Yeah, and it's the choices you make. You need to know the validity behind those choices. Yeah, and I think it's also inspiring and important to remember. Like if we, slavery is a dangerous term because it's so big, you right. know, that it can be used a little bit clumsily. I think like if you think of um, just labor and human rights abuses, something a little bit less um, uh, edgy, and you think of um, in the last 40 years and you look at other supply chain moments, you think of sweatshop garments or <laughs> you think of blood diamonds or you think of, you know, kind of dolphin free tuna, right? These are other moments where again, they didn't solve the problem. Yeah, we can agree on that. But there was this reckoning, you know, right. something happened, there was a big story or some big movie star got involved or whatever. Um, and suddenly everyone knew about it. And suddenly the corporate players and the governments had to do something about it. Right. And all of a sudden things emerged, flawed things, certification systems and- This is an example. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know that, that, as much as I wish you were right, I don't know that that book has done the trick. But, but so I think, there's a lot of precedent for like different supply chains, different, you know, types of commodities having these moments. And I feel like, you know, marine life or seafood um, are having the <laughs> beginning of, of this moment because of years of work that you guys have been doing in, in the ocean conservation community and um, other players, John Kerry and the EU yellow carding and some journalists and, you know, various players all together are starting to get more attention on these things. That's awesome. Can we take some more questions? Yep. All so right. Stephanie, have a little more time. Yeah. No, I'm. I'm <laughs> Thank here. you. I'm in a hotel. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie's asking, how is it that you get notified when things like this are happening, or where ships will be? Are there informants, or how does that work for you? 
Mm, yeah, it varies, right? So the, the Thunder um, I heard about, the Chase of Thunder, because I, I had a, a source from a, another story years ago that was at the at Interpol, and I had called him and said, hey, you know, you're at the Marine Division now, and if you hear, I'm really on the market for good stories. So if you hear of anything crazy and weird, let me know. And he called and said, hey, have you heard about this thing? And off it went. Um, Lang Long, I knew, you know, the guy who was, the Cambodian who was shackled, I had spent months and months researching the problem of sea slavery and was trying to decide, should I go to the Falkland Islands and the fleet near there, or South Korea or Ghana or, or the South China Sea near Thailand. There are all these places where there were hot spots of really problematic forced labor. And so I started looking around, you start talking to advocates who work and academics um, who work in those areas and ask them, you know, are you seeing a lot of cases? Tell me about some of them, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, you start sizing up sources. Really so much of good journalism is assessments of people and, you know, like um, uh, finding people that you trust and will be faithful to you and, and kind of give you good information in a timely fashion. And I had some really good sources in Thailand and they said, oh, you really need to go to Songkla. There's, there's some stuff happening down there. That's great. You got a lot of people signing in, just congratulating you, Ian, and saying, <laughs> "Keep at it." it. <laughs> well, thank you. I Carry agree. on. Yeah, make it so. Probably, those people are probably my relatives, like my yeah. mom. Or, <laughs> oh, that's all right. Well, <laughs> so Olivia is asking us about uh, your thoughts about the future of deep sea mining. Yeah. High seas. High seas. Yeah. I mean, you know, the three of us have talked about this for a year and a half now. Um, yeah. So you guys know. Um, so just to take a step back, deep sea mining, seabed mining, you know, is this kind of, we're on the front edge of it. It seems to be kind of, if, if, the, if the high seas are the next frontier, then the sea floor is the frontier beyond the frontier. You know, it's truly removed and then some because it's out there at sea underwater. And there's just even, it, it's a really dark place when it comes to governance and oversight. And the, the, there are many things that are worrisome about seabed mining. One is the drive to do it um, is a drive that um, to a large degree is a hunger for precious metals, manganese and others that are often serving um, the purpose of, of giving us gadgets we love like the iPhone, but also long lasting batteries and these sorts of things that we are embracing to try to deal with our climate change problems. And so that demand is um, in many ways good because it's trying to solve one problem, but it might be fueling the creation of other problems. So that's mm -hmm. a really worrisome potential. Uh, the, the bodies that are supposed to be keeping an eye on this, namely the Seabed Mining Authority is an unusually arcane, opaque, you know, problematic, um, agency, if you will, um, that uh, for, for which it's really unclear just to be conservative that they're doing their job in policing um, companies and requiring environmental impact ass assessments and really doing some protective due diligence. So that's worrisome. The, the place where it's happening, it's an industrial activity happening on the seafloor where we know less than nothing, you know, about the impacts of what what that would do, the the kicking up of all the soot, um, the the kind of the plume flattening the plume, um, the diversity of life that lives yeah. in the so, deep sea, and, and 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 so that's another reason to worry. And then that most of the places where um, mining is likely to begin, Papua New Guinea and other places, um, are places where the governments are desperate for income, you know, and, and therefore probably willing to to. Um, to make fast deals, just to give them the benefit of the doubt, you know, and there often are corrupt lobbyists and key players who are, you know, kind of um, taking advantage of that situation. So all those factors together um, make me think it's a really scary thing. And, um, you know, the three of us have been trying to figure out a good way to, to, to sort of tell the story, um, not as an article for, for me, um, we could write right now, and many people have done quite a good job writing articles about it, but I'm trying to find a narrative way to do it that would show these concerns. Um, yeah. But I, I definitely, as I think you guys do, think it's a it's a really big concern. Yeah, and just thinking of the you know, amount of energy required to go to these depths. I mean, I know what it takes to go down there and do a science mission. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, you're it's not like you're bringing up 
oil or gas which wants to be naturally buoyant and come to the surface you're talking about trying to like pump mm -hmm. flurried rock uh, or living rock off the you know off the seabed very heavy uh, material now, it's going to take an, an enormous amount of fossil fuel to bring that yeah. kind of stuff up and, and, and when you get and money, like when you get yeah, yeah. multi-billion-dollar players involved, I get nervous because the multi-billion-dollar players have multi-billion-dollar lawyers and lobbyists, yep. and and when that's who you're dealing with, like you know the the wall of governance and journalistic oversight and all these things becomes impenetrable because yeah. you know they've got the money to to insulate themselves. So yeah. that worries me too. Yeah, me too. Plenty of room for corruption. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So um, Evelyn's asking us, uh, with everything that happened with the thunder, did it actually send other ships on the purple list into hiding or make them nervous? Yeah, I mean, the Operation Ice Fist, I only looked at the thunder. It was this, you know, long and complicated and um, really impressive in many ways endeavor in which the Sea Shepherd folks chased a bunch of the other purple listers. Um, the Kunlun, um, it's been a while now, so I'm forgetting the name. I used to know them by heart, but Sea Shepherd went after a lot of them and, and caught some of them and then sort of sort of caught others where they were in port and they were supposed to be arrested and then they snuck out. And, you know, there, there were all sorts of different outcomes with, with I think five of the seven, if not all seven. Um, but yeah, they were all targeted over the course of whatever, three years that that campaign ran. Um, I don't think any of them were as dramatic as I recall reading about them and following as the Thunder. Um, uh, and some of the players were just um, uh, kind of, they had a really bad patch there because they had these annoying conservationists on their tail. But then, <laughs> you know, as things go, everyone had to move on and and they changed their name, reflagged, and they were back at it, which isn't to say it's not worth doing, but some of those players I know for a fact are still out there and the ships are still operating. They just have a different name and um, they're still bad news, but yeah. Um, More work to be done. Oh yeah. Right. So Alex is saying that with a horribly flawed food system, ballooning human population and growing income inequality and the consistent disconnect from where our food comes from and how it's harvested, where do we go? What do we do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, great guru. Oh, guru. Yeah, that, this is the story. You'll see me getting like hives and sweating, like not feeling comfortable with this. Um, not because it's not a good question, but just because it's at such a high altitude that yeah. I have a little vertigo. Um, yeah, I, I, I tend to demand that we come down, like it's a question about the war and I'm I'm of the view that the war is ongoing and maybe even unwinnable, but it doesn't mean you don't, that you don't fight it. You, you, you fight the battles the entire time and you can win many of the battles, but I never get into discussion about the war. You know, it's, it's yeah. so, cause I don't believe the answers I hear about winning the war, nor do I think I have that level of insight. Um, so I, I guess I would say don't, go to meta uh, and try to find doable things within your interests and abilities and um, and and focus on those. Um, that's a really Pollyanna response, but it's the best I can muster. No, but if, if everybody, if 8 billion do something in the right direction, right. we'll yeah. get change. Yeah. And, and whatever think, it is, everybody can do something. Yeah, and they, yeah, and, it, and, it, and as the ocean elders talk about, you know, just their, their one thing campaign and, and just mm -hmm. sort of picking the things that, that are achievable for you. So you don't get too, you know, depressed and dejected, right. but you, there's things that everyone can do mm -hmm. that yeah. um, combined can help make a Give tuna difference. a pass. Give tuna a pass. <laughs> try to, try to at least understand where your food is coming from, you know, yeah. it, buy as local as you can. Yeah. and seasonal you know little things like that can can help as as we start to address the, and try to address these much bigger problems yeah and, um, and i would just go back to like don't forget that you're not just a consumer you're also a voter a taxpayer a donor right. a parent a spouse you're lots of things and each of those categories you can do little things and so yeah maybe you choose this over that in terms of your dietary or buying things but you also choose to set aside 15 minutes to talk with your son or daughter about this or or your partner um and you also decide you're going to give you know 10 bucks to this organization and you're also going to check out what this guy's voting you know record is on this issue like again in all of those capacities you can do small things and they add up to a multi-leveraged approach. Absolutely. 
Um, David is asking us, what about the 30 by 30 initiative and how can we increase marine protected areas? So I'm not a 30 by 30 expert. I mean, I, I know the reference here and again to the others, um, this is the goal of setting aside and correct me guys here if I'm wrong, as you surely know, but- It's a good start. 30% yeah. of, of the ocean surface being protected by- That doesn't mean you can have your way with all the rest. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you know, it's one of those things where I think that I'd love to see sort of more of a push on, you know, to the UN to say, why aren't we working on an international treaty to protect 30 percent? At least. At least yeah. now, not by 2030. Yeah. <laughs> you know, why are we waiting? You know, we know. Some countries aren't. I mean, Chile yeah. is has moved ahead with 40 percent of their exclusive economic zone under at least some form of protection and mm -hmm. little island nation of Palau, 80%. Yeah. That doesn't mean that they're just squandering all the rest. Yeah. They have management of all of it. Yeah. And yeah. basically that's kind of the way we should look at the whole world. Isn't yeah. it about nature? We need to be mindful of not abusing any of it. Yeah. But some areas we really need to cherish and treat as sacred in a way. Yeah. Because they have a higher degree of of vulnerability or greater answers like old growth forest. There's no excuse for slashing any more of old growth forest. And that applies perhaps to the deep sea. Mm -hmm. with old growth on a mega scale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These manganese nodules are millions of years old, not just thousands. And they're living. And they're living, right? You know, they're, they're not still dead living. rocks. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. just the yeah. thought that if you, we can identify the most critical areas to really embrace with a high level of care, but recognize that we can't just abuse any of it, even your backyard. You know, we, yeah. we need to do what you can do where you can do it and yeah. then try to impact the rest. But yeah. 30, 30 by 30 is a, is a catchy phrase and it might even work. Right. Because it's something that people are beginning to recognize that protecting nature means you can breathe. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that the climate, you're giving yourself a break when you give climate a break. Mm -hmm. How do you fix that? You, by protecting nature mm -hmm. every way you can. Yeah. yeah. Protect yeah. our life support system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got time for one more question and we're going to, we're going to put Ian on the hot seat again from Todd. He wants to know, he says, you're the knight in shining armor, <laughs> shining diving suit. But what is your closest call in dealing with these uh, outlaws on the high seas? Um, yeah, I, I hate these. I mean, I, I, I don't like these questions that make me out to be some action hero, because that's definitely not. Um, I'm going to look for that next like figure, you know. <laughs> exactly. it'll, it'll look like Paul Giamatti, and it'll be nerdy. And, He's a Barbie, you know. <laughs> Exactly, right, exactly. Oh, I, I, um, with your backpack. Yeah, <laughs> backpack. action figure with your backpack. Right. Yeah. Like hunched over and worn bags under my eyes. Um, uh, closest call. Uh, well, Somalia. Yeah, if you've read the book, then then that that we, we got in big, big trouble in Somalia. We being Fabio Nascimento, my Brazilian um, uh, partner in crime here and photographer, videographer, and he and I, um, uh, really got stranded in Puntland in, in a certain place and our protection left and we were stuck there and hiding out on a rooftop for uh, until we could get out. And that's one place where I, I, I literally thought um, we might not make it out alive because we were getting told as much, you know. Mm. Um, and then in Borneo, we were um, trying to um, uh, investigate um, this uh, really inspiring underground railroad of of anti-trafficking folks who help rescue Langlongs, you know, th these sorts of captive crew. And um, there was a rescue underway. A guy was hiding out in the mountains of Borneo. He had run from his ship and he was being hunted by bounty hunters hired by the captain. We got there and, and you know, in this rubber plantation, interviewed him and halfway through the interview, some guys with guns showed up and said the interview's over. And, you know, that, that was kind of scary um, yeah. uh, as well. So. Truth be told, the, the thing that was scariest were the conditions, um, uh, you know, the, the the potential of getting infection or bitten by, you know, rats or just um, getting some sort of sickness and you're being, you're out at sea on a ship and they're not going to take you back in, you know. Yeah. Um, 
but I always say whenever I delve into these dodgy waters, um, anything that scared me and any threat I faced pales in comparison to two categories of others. One is the people I'm reporting on. I mean, those people, I have an American passport and money and, and a way out. And these people are undocumented um, from the global South. In many ways, they are invisible and expendable. And they are really you know, threatened you know, on a daily basis with, with harm. Uh, and then the people that I work with and rely on the translators, the photographers who are in country, and they have to stay there when I leave, and, and they're there when I write the story and it comes out. Like those people are actually the ones who face real danger. Nothing I face is anything like what they encounter. Right, because they've got to they've got to live there in that community and right. and it's survive there, survive there. And we've seen you know like a huge uptick in the just in the you know the outright murder of conservationists right. and people right. that you know they yeah. stick their head up and. You know, it's whack, you know, they, they just, they, and journalists, you know, journalists in these countries, um, you know, uh, they've been targeted, whether it's Somalia or Brazil or wherever, you know, these places, um, it's very dangerous to, um, to do this work. Yeah. I thought you might say that you were most afraid of drinking the water when you're on those ships. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have a white straw. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a pretty, um, strong stomach and I bring obscene amounts of pills of every sort with me um, uh, uh, because I've been sick so many times on these ships that now I um, so I've, yeah I've been okay with the water thus far the, the, the things they cook for me to eat um, that's a different matter you know like yeah. some of the stuff I, like, uh, I'm not going to survive this meal but uh, I always eat whatever's in front of me because you know you'll lose your source if you don't must be doing something right. Just keep keep on <laughs> doing it. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I really hope people will pitch in and help support you. And help support what you're doing. Yeah. We Thank need you. more more of you. Right. Well, well <laughs> we right really need to you. take care of yourself. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And and I appreciate you hosting this. Thank you. And before we close today, we just would like to say Thank you to our producers, the Ocean Elders, and mostly to everyone out in the community that keeps uh, showing up to these uh, sessions and participating with us week after week and month after month. Um, right. Divin is really feeling like home to us, and I hope it does to you. And um, You're welcome back anytime, Ian. And we're very grateful. <laughs> yeah. We're grateful to, to, to you for checking in and grateful to everyone who uh, keeps joining us on these little adventures, <laughs> getting these great stories going. You know, the water does connect all of us. Um, and you're making us believe that this platform is going to be able to make a difference. And before we go, um, on February 11th, we're going to have Carl Safina join us. Oh, that's great. Oh. Great. So maybe you'll come and ask him some questions. Get even. <laughs> I will. Yeah. I <laughs> if you're will. not out at sea, you know, battling. No, you know, I will. Rats, I'll email rats. <laughs> but before we go, we need to remember that. We, we have to take care of the ocean. As if our lives depend on it. Because they do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. Thank you, Ian. Thanks Thank so you, much. everyone. Until take next care. time. Bye-bye. <laughs>